Apparently there isn't. Uh, so, um, yes, I think we can perfectly well start. So, uh, my name is Martin Wolf uh, from the Financial Times, and I'm going to be moderating this uh, very interesting panel on, um, I think, an, an enormously important subject which I covered um, in my column this morning from the inverse point of view, which is the new authoritarianism um, and its nature and spread. Um, we have um, serious scholars um, have been referring now for some time to the last 13, 14 years or so as an era of quote unquote democratic recession, namely uh, sh uh, shifting away from democratic systems and democratic norms, even in countries with very well entrenched democracies. So there's a lot of anxiety about this, and that makes the topic very vital to me. Um, and I think to all of us um, who believe very passionately in the validity of the democratic ideal. Uh, so let me just introduce, having made that um, very, very brief introduction of what I think makes this so important, um, uh, then I will introduce the speakers, make a couple of other remarks, and then we'll start the discussion. So to my left is uh, Mr. Nicole Pashinyan, um, who is Prime Minister of the Republic of Armenia. Uh, to his left is KP Sharma Oli, who is the Prime Minister of Nepal. Uh, to his left is um, Arthur Greg Sulzberger, who is publisher of one of the world's great newspapers, New York Times. Um, uh, I don't think I need to say more about that publication. To his left is Daniela Balu Ares. I hope I've got the pronunciation more or less right. I apologize if I haven't. Who is chief executive officer of the Leadership Now Project and also a young global leader. I'm prepared to forgive you for that. And, uh, and, uh, and finally, uh, to her left is Ivan Duque, who is um, the president of Colombia. Part of the background, um, which I think is very interesting to this, and particularly relevant with the participants we have, was an enormous surge in democratization in developing countries uh, after about 1980. And the proportion of the world's regimes were th that were democratic mainly because of that surge in developing countries, reached a peak in about 2006 on the standard measures. And one of the interesting phenomena we are seeing is while a lot of developing countries are showing a great deal of interest in enthusiasm about democratic norms and democratic systems, we are seeing some quite significant erosion of that in um, major Western democracies, um, I would say not excluding the US. So this is a very live, a live topic, as I've already indicated, but the, 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 the idea of democracy as a universal political system has, I think, become, was at one stage very widely accepted across many different types of countries and is now, to some extent, again, quite widely under attack. So um, with that, let me start um, with the questions. Uh, so let me start with you, Prime Minister Pashinyan. Um, uh, what are the critical choices you're facing in your country now in order to cement a democracy that works? What do you see as the big challenges and the successes you have made? Thank you very much. Um, I hope you know that uh, last year we uh, had a non-violent yes, democratic revolution and uh, uh, last month we had um, uh, elections 
parliamentarian elections, which was assessed as a free, democratic, and transparent. And now um, we we have huge success on democracy, but we have uh, also big challenges and most important challenges to make uh, our democracy stronger economically. Because, you know, we, we had a big problem uh, within long years and within decades uh, connected with electoral bribes when um, people, due to their, their uh, poverty, were actually forced to take electoral bribes and uh, to vote according to electoral bribes. Of course, uh, the uh, recent uh, revolution uh, freed temporarily people uh, from that duty, but now we, we need to make our citizens uh, stronger and more independent in terms of uh, economy. And now what we are going to do, now we are going to establish, to create a new, uh, new uh, sector in our uh, economic um, uh, structure. Uh, you know that there is a small business, uh, there is a medium business, but we are going to create a new category in our uh, business structures like micro business and uh, to make free uh, uh, this kind of business from taxes in the hope that we will be able to encourage and to inspire our people that and to um, explain them uh, that uh, not only government is um, responsible for uh, overcoming uh, their poverty, but also uh, they should do something. And we want to encourage our people, but of course to create real opportunities for our people to fight against their own, own poverty. So my, my answer is our uh, main challenge is to make stronger our uh, democracy economically, and uh, we hope to attract new foreign investment to our country because we were able to fight corruption, uh, to make uh, uh, establish real rule of law, and uh, we are going to make uh, regulatory simplifications to attract more foreign investments to our country. Thank so you very much. I think you made a very clear and important point, which is very widely accepted, which is that democracy is a necessary condition for a stable democracy. There's a lot of evidence is reasonable prosperity among the public. And I think it's important to stress that link. Prime Minister Oli, could you talk a little bit about the state of democracy in Nepal? I understand there's some controversy about the degree of centralization in the government. So you might want to refer how that fits within the democratic framework. There are very, I've just been to India and there are lots of complaints about centralization in the government in India. Um, so obviously a lot of that is to, about how you make a government effective in a developing country, which is democratic. So just describe briefly what you see as the big challenges. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Uh, First of all, I would like to make clear that uh, democracy is a system and should be a system of the people, for the people. And we have brought tremendous changes in the field of democracy. We abolished autocratic system and established democracy. There is now Federal Democratic Republic in Nepal. And the present government is elected by the people. Uh, and the elections were uh, held by, not by my party. At that time I was in the opposition. But uh, the then ruling party held the election. And the results were uh, not only results, but uh, the elections were free, fair, and impartial in peaceful atmosphere. And in the present time, it is very important that elections were free, 
free and fair. And we have prime ministerial system and uh, executive power are in the cabinet and in the prime minister. So there is no question of centralizing the power. And I fought for democracy for more than half a century myself. I spent many years in prison for democratic laws. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to be a ruler, but a servant of the people who want to serve. But I want to expand democracy from political limits, limits of the rights, limits of the freedoms, to bring the changes in the lives of the people. And that democracy should be comprehensive democracy, rule of law. And as you ask me, there is a, a system. We promulgated the Constitution uh, in 1915, uh, 2015, and uh, we have completely democratic system. And there is separation of power, check and balance, independent judiciary, etc. And we have parliament, bicameral, and there is rule of law. And we don't want to, and we have no, not that kind of facility to make any pretension or excuse, but we have to bring the changes in the lives of the people. So we have focused now to bring change in the economic field. So we want to uh, concentrate ourselves and are concentrating ourselves on the question of good governance and economic development so that our motto we can meet, that our motto is prosperous Nepal, happy Nepali. Okay, thank you very much. In a way, your re reply was not so different from yours, um, stressing, among other things, the economic um, aspects, the economic challenges of government in a, in the, Nepal's case, obviously quite a poor developing countries. So President Duque, um, your country actually economically did, did quite well for quite a long time and has had a pretty good record, but you've also had a terrible civil war. Um, and uh, so describe the challenges you feel that you confront and confronted when you took power and what progress you're making. Well, let me begin, first of all, by, by thanking you, Martin, for that question. We have, in Colombia, we have suffered for many years the threat of violence, terrorist groups. And I think it, was, it is positive that now one of those terrorist groups or those armed groups is in the process of reincorporation. I received a signed peace process, which had many fragile elements. And uh, I decided from the first day of our, my administration to work very hard so that the people who were in the process of reincorporation succeeded. And that means that we need to find for them specific productive activities, find job opportunities, and at the same time, bring government investment to those regions that have been badly affected by violence historically. So we're doing that. And I think that's very important for the future of Colombian democracy. But at the same time, I believe that we have also other challenges to make Colombian democracy even better. And let me begin with something that, that we have also leaded from government, women participation in decision-making process. For the first time, we have a paritary cabinet in our country. And for the first time, we have a woman, who, a woman who's vice president. So I see the Colombian democracy growing and expanding and being more, more, more robust with women participation. And in the other hand, I think it's very important that, that minorities in Colombia participate more actively. And that implies that the government needs to, to lead the way that people think about their, their future, their projects, how they formulate agendas, how they, uh, they have claims for the government. 
And since the first day of our administration, every Saturday we have town halls in different regions of the country where we invite all the people from minorities and specific groups to participate and formulate projects. And we have built the Colombian National Plan based on that <laughs> participation, which I also think strengthens our democracy. So where does all, the, all this leads? That's the, the most important question. Where do we want to be as a country in two decades? We have an income per capita of around $7,000, and I want Colombia to become a country with a per capita income of more than $30,000. And maybe that will take us two decades, but we need to start now. And the way we, we manage public policy, for me, has to be based on pedagogy and not demagogy. So you need to tell the people that the right way of strengthening all these all this, uh, democratic issues has to be based on three principles. Legality, fighting corruption, fighting criminal groups, expanding the rule of law, entrepreneurship, which means to recognize that to make social progress, you need to have free markets, but those free markets needs to be, need to be socially responsible. And at the same time, the right objective is fairness. And that fairness means closing the gaps between rich and poor and the regional gaps. So that's, that's how I see all the pieces together. And finally, if I may say this as well, where do we want to be in terms of, of the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution? An issue that has been discussed in this World Economic Forum session. The fourth industrial revolution we want to embrace it. That's why today we launched the first center in Latin America, because we believe that if we want to be a high income country, we need to embrace, adopt, and adopt the right policies. And that will help us make the people secure that the middle class will expand, that they will not be harmed by their industrial revolution, and that by through education and closing the digital gap, we will bring more opportunities to the Colombian people. I will, I will put that in that, okay. in that package, Mark. That, that's very um, ambitious uh, and interesting. And I'll come back to some of the really interesting questions that are implicit in all three comments about the relationship between democracy and economic progress, which I think is really one of the central debates of our time. And it's a return of debates, I remember, from my youth in the 60s. I'd like to turn to you, uh, Ms. Luares. Tell us about your project, what you're doing, and why it's going to make a difference. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Martin. You know, you started uh, this discussion by saying that authoritarianism is on the rise, and we have a fundamental risk to democracy. And what you see right now around the world is that trust in government and trust in political systems to solve problems are at historic lows in many democracies. In the US, we've gone from 70% trust in government in the 1960s to less than 20% today. So we started the Leadership Now project as a response to that, as an effort to mobilize next generation business leaders to be part of solving those challenges. Uh, I, you know, it's fair, I think many would argue that the role of business and democracy has not always been positive. Uh, and some of those critiques certainly have merit. But what we saw as an opportunity was to really set out a path for what principled leadership in democracy can look like. Leadership that prioritizes renewing and restoring our democratic system and doing that in service of an economy that works for all and for future generations. So not only are we really uh, seeing the need and opportunity to bring every segment of society into the conversation of renewing democracy, um, but also to look at it in new ways. So of the, over the last years, what we've done is bring together leading academics, democracy experts, data scientists, to really understand what are the fundamental challenges to American democracy right now. We've had everyone from Harvard Law Professor Larry Lessig to Michael Porter from Harvard Business School who are studying the drivers of dysfunction in the US. And we layer that with some novel data science and analysis that's looking at where are the resources in the system, where is money flowing, how is it influencing politics in the US. 
And what we've learned from that is that there really are two fundamental challenges uh, that we're facing. We're facing a talent problem and a systems problem. And we're going to have to tackle them together. On the talent side, we've seen multiple generations in the US now completely disengaged from politics. If you're under 55 in the US, you probably aren't voting. You're not running for office. If you go to a top university, only it's in the single digits, the share of people who are going on to public service. So we need a dramatic step up in participation at every level in the US. On the system side, we have some fundamental structural issues that are undermining effectiveness. We have a primary system that drives candidates to the extremes. We have something called gerrymandering, which means politicians draw their own political districts and then stay in them for a very long time. Uh, we have increasing money in politics and its influence around narrow interests. And we have an erosion of commitment to facts and science, both in policymaking and in the media. So those are big problems. <laughs> but we really do think it's the project of our generation, not just a two-year election cycle project, but a project of the decade ahead uh, to work to fixing democracy uh, and to do it across every se segment of society. Thank you very much. That's, uh, I think, a pretty comprehensive brief view of some of the issues that certainly a number of Western democracies face. Now let me turn to you um, finally in this introductory round, Mr. Salzberger. Um, so um, the old media um, designation we share, my employer and yours, uh, have been very much under the attack, on, under attack. Um, uh, they've been accused of disseminating fake news and a lot of people believe that. Um, so how do you view the role of the media in contemporary democracies? How do you think they can best tackle and deal with those attack, those assaults, uh, and regain the trust of the public? Um. Well, let me say first, I don't think old media is under attack. I think independent media is under attack, um, regardless of whether it's a newspaper like ours or um, a digital publisher uh, or broadcaster. Look, it, it shouldn't need to be said, but the events of the last couple of years make it unmistakably clear that it needs to be said and said often. Um, a free press is essential to democracy. At the New York Times, our mission is to seek the truth, hold power to account, and help people understand the world. That is a mission that's shared by news organizations all over the world. And if you look at that list, truth, accountability, and understanding, that's exactly what a society needs in order to self-govern. So um, the success of democracy in many ways hinges on uh, the empowerment of a free press to interrogate uh, its um, systems and leaders. Um, and this has been a time of extraordinary and unprecedented pressure on a free press. And I think it's something that should alarm everyone in this room and everyone on this stage. Uh, we're seeing journalists being jailed imprisoned, harassed, reined in by laws meant to, um, uh, to uh, uh, push journalists to self-censor. And, um, and the press certainly has a role in you know, making the case for its own importance. Uh, but, but I think that, that everyone in society, every institution in particular, the, you know, democratic leadership need to embrace the centrality of its role uh, if, if, if we're to succeed. So I'd like to ask a few follow-up questions. And I actually would like to start with the one that you have raised. I'd like to talk to um, the three political leaders. Um, perhaps I'll start with you. So what's your relationship with the press? Uh, and what do you, how do you buy, 
No, obviously, I understand no political leader likes the press because they're full of criticism. Well, uh, you uh, might be the exception. Yeah, but you might be the exception, <laughs> yeah. you see. Um, so do you agree with Mr. Salzberger's view? And have you... Uh, and... Uh, um, how does how how in your country does this relationship with the press work? You know, actually, I'm a jo journalist. I know I'm that's a why former, I that's why I started uh, with you, chief editor and former political prisoner. But uh, to, uh, and uh, now I, I can say that in Armenia, uh, press is now is free than never. Uh, but uh, not all journalists uh, are agree with uh, agree with me. Uh, because they think that it's a uh, kind of egg exaggeration that now uh, in Armenia uh, press fully free, but I can insist on that. And, you know, uh, I, I, I think it's um, a normal thing that uh, the uh, relation between press and government should be a kind of, uh, the, uh, a kind of um, with tension. Uh, because because uh, when uh, when um, uh, we uh, see that uh, now uh, there is uh, low trust um, about the government uh, capacities all around the world and it can be connected with the fact that now all people uh, society uh, knows uh, know uh, uh, more about uh, uh, high officials than uh, before because every every nuance can affect on the people's belief on politicians on uh, ministers etc cetera, etc cetera. so the uh, full transparency uh, i think will uh, reduce the level of uh, uh, the level of um, uh, belief uh, toward the government because because uh, uh, at first many people uh, many people think that uh, these people which are presidents and ministers should be uh, should be like gods uh, like like uh, sent people but if they uh, fi uh, find out that these people uh, eat every every day ordinary meal and has some ordinary needs uh, they became uh, um, a belief uh, 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 they believe on on these people uh, became um, less and less that that's my point of view that's interesting um, do you think you should remain then that these people should continue to think you're saints <laughs> <laughs> Difficult to pull off, probably. Um, President Duque, what is your relationship you know, with I, your press? I, you get uh, up every morning. I value, I value democracy a lot. And Colombia is one of the oldest democracies in Latin America. And I think a fundamental piece of a democracy is free press. So the role of a political leader, the role of a of a president or a congressman, of somebody who's in public office, is to evaluate what the press is trying to put before the public agenda for discussion. So I value that. Now, you have put your question also in times of, of changes worldwide. And now I can say that one of the challenges that, that the press faces everywhere is that people who were in the past editors or, or, or journalists who, who wrote about uh, common daily activities or daily events now have become more activists because they are also participating in, in uh, social media. So that also is changing the way the press behaves and I think is something that, that is going to make democracy, it, to, uh, it's going to drive democracy to adapt to those changes. So this is going to make the press more vocal, more active, more... Uh, instantly reacting to events, and I think that's positive. So if we really want to have a better future for democracies, we have to see all these things that are happening as opportunities. And obviously, when you're in public office, you might have differences, but the most important thing is to respect, to protect, and to see independent press as one of the fundamental pillars of liberal democracy. Finally, I'll ask you, what is your relationship with the press? I have normal relationship with the press. And uh, in uh, democracy, 
always i think there are normal relationship a little bit sorry normal relationship okay. with the press with the media because in autocracy media is controlled just the uh, press the rulers but in democracy even they criticize that's normal thing and uh, we have press freedom press are free and independent but uh, my opinion is in another aspect uh, there is a term elo journalism uh, that is not good to disturb the things to mislead the people that must the press is very instrumental to strengthen democracy to bring development and prosperity in the lives of the people to inform accurately to the people to educate people the rule of the press is very important and press so people want to see is responsible responsible press press they want to see uh, and uh, of course a little bit they criticize me and the expectations of the people because we have uh, uh, brought so many changes so fastly and their aspirations are increased raised so in this sense contest the people's aspirations are high and the press has also the similar expectations with the government sometimes development process are not like magic they take time so they want to hurry up they want to be clean and clear they want to be and they want to be uh, transparent as well so uh, fresh is instrumental strengthening for strengthening democracy and it's useful for development and ict or technology there are two aspects of course development aspect and to some extra uh, uh, they they there are problems also like uh, uh, young generation are being misled by Uh, some uh, uh, social media, etc. We so you, we should be uh, very careful about uh, all these things so to create a civilized and developed society. Model. So I, there are some lots of questions, most of which we're going to explore. But there's one really big issue that has come up, which I think goes across these countries. And I start. I'll go with to you on this, but also you. Um, um, social media, and the new. the new digital landscape the new media landscape which is obviously powerfully transformative in that it's given everybody a voice those voices are very different kinds to put it mildly um you get heard often by the most extreme s- statements and views um you can create alternative universes many alternative universes so um This is a, and a, I think it's a great temptation also for individual. I'm a, probably I don't know whether I'm unique, but I've never been on Twitter or any of these things. I think they're absolutely lethal, but uh, um, but it's a transformed environment. Mm-hmm. Um, so looking at the U.S. experience, which is where you know, sort of everything is ahead of everybody else, how would you evaluate the capacity of democracy as we've known it, as we knew it? to cope with this completely transformed information landscape without any established of authoritative media in the way that we one would have taken for granted 50 or 60 years ago i want to <clears throat> address that directly but do you mind if i just circle back to one to one oh, item oh, that oh. came up here first you know i think it's worth acknowledging that the united states has been historically the the world's greatest champion of a free press of course. since we're talking about of it of course that's why and we have two americans here i'm sure 
and and the United States has has publicly retreated from that position Indeed. in a way that I think has encouraged and facilitated press crackdowns around the globe. We are seeing journalists jailed, murdered. Um, when I met uh, with President Trump to raise my profound and growing concerns about his his anti press rhetoric um, from the phrase fake news to uh, the much more insidious phase, enemy, the phrase enemy of the people. Um, uh, he pointed out to me that, um, uh, with some degree of pride, that, uh, that multiple countries had, um, had actually banned fake news. Um, and uh, my response to him was that, you know, those countries weren't banning fake news, they were banning their dictatorships and tyrannies that were banning independent scrutiny of, of, of leadership and power. And uh, they were banning real news. And I think, you know, th there are a lot of questions that have, you know, come up about social, I'll circle back to that, but I do think that that has created a climate that has fostered um, more space for anti-press crackdowns. And, um, and I don't want to go too far here, but I think it's important to acknowledge that there have been some anti-press laws passed in, in your country um, uh, that have effectively criminalized um, routine news gathering, um, requiring permission, um, prior permission for the publication of personal information, um, and to some extent, um, uh, banning uh, criticism of, uh, of public officials. And, and I know that is always balanced against another set of facts, but I do think um, that it's important for us to recognize that across the globe, we need to be pushing uh, for, 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 for fewer restrictions and more of an embrace of, of press rights. Do you want me to circle back to social Very media? briefly, yeah. Um, look, I think, I think social media, this is a, um, I don't think democracy has yet learned how to incorporate social media. I don't think the platforms are fully, uh, had fully internalized, and I think are still in the process of internalizing their power. Um, Facebook alone reaches 2.2 billion people, um, making it the most powerful information monopoly in the history of the world. Um, and, and others are, are close behind it. Um, and you can still be a skeptic of, of overregulation. Uh, um, and find yourself realizing that, that this free-for-all environment is, is being actively uh, misused um, for uh, sometimes nefarious ends. Wouldn't it be a bit paradoxical, I mean, just pushing this Cree issue in the US where First Amendment rights are so fundamental to push for some form of, which is very widely done now, yeah. re some form of regulation of the key social media. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there are more ways to do it badly than to do it well, and I think that's really important that, you know, that, that societies go into to any conversation about this clear-eyed, uh, that you can accidentally uh, cause a lot of trouble. But, you know, to use, use one obvious example, and this is, this is an example where, um, where Facebook Book and others deserve some credit for for movement. Um, you know the the regulatory regime around disclosing, you know the source of political advertising was much stronger in uh, in print, radio, and television than it was in the internet on the internet or social media. Despite reaching vastly more people, and and that's the type of loophole that was that was widely exploited. So, um, Daniela. Um, social media, and um, I'd like to, the, what do you feel about this issue? Yeah, <clears throat> two things. One, I think um, one of the disturbing pieces of data that we looked at was how uh, fake news travels more quickly in social media than not fake news. That, and that's not only because of bots. I mean, that's just people um, clicking on things that look interesting and sharing it in their networks. So I think that's one of the you know, that's one of the many fundamental challenges that we need to figure out and address. But one other angle I'd like to take on social media is, um, while it keeps people 
up to date and informed and like um, nothing else, it's not a substitute for genuine political engagement. And I think we've had an element where people feel like, I've clicked like on Facebook, I've shared an article, and now I've taken my stand in politics. And the reality <laughs> is that's not changing anything. And we really lack kind of social connectivity and capital in politics in a certain way. So if in previous generations someone might have joined a political party or been kind of deeply involved in political activities, people don't join political parties anymore in the US other than to show up at a primary. Um, so there is a real need to foster genuine deep engagement in politics, build on people's existing social networks um, to, to engage them. It's an interesting thing that you see um, one of the, some of the most powerful forces in politics in the US are as much social clubs as they are political forces. So you take the National Rifle Association, for instance, in the US, which does have a lot of influence on their issues in politics, but it's also where people go to picnics and have social connectivity. Uh, so one of the things we've seen as an opportunity at the Leadership Now Project is tapping into, for instance, university alumni networks and other networks that have strong social connectivity and can be a space for really tackling our big problems in politics and democracy. Can I ask, I'm going to try and get through two questions very quickly and then go to the floor because there's so many issues. But there's a very specific issue which I think any of you can comment on, but I think not all, um, which is very relevant here, which is the role of business in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, it's obviously a big issue in the states. And so I sort of think, is business the problem or the solution? I'm inclined to think in this context is the problem. Because um, basically indifferent to democratic norms and very happy if they get favors for themselves and not too concerned about the overall political context. Is that wildly unfair? Um, no, you know, I, I touched on earlier, I do think critique of the role of business um, in politics is, is not without merit. Um, but I, I'd like to distinguish that in a couple of ways. Uh, business participating in lobbying and, um, and in protecting their interests is one way that you see business participating, and there are many valid critiques of um, how interest is used in that setting. But the reality is, is that we have a whole, I, I would argue, generation of entrepreneurs and innovators and people in the business community um, who haven't participated, who have been on the sidelines. And so if we're to suggest everyone in business is, is equivalent to a kind of narrow interest play in politics, I think we're gonna lose a lot of opportunity to bring people into the um, process and be part of sol kind of renewing our democracy, defining what's kind of democracy 2.0 um, that we could have had as part of the solution as opposed to sitting on the sidelines. Can I just now turn to you? There was a specific, you must have the right to reply, I think. There was a specific charge made by Mr. Sulzberger that some of the legislation that you have introduced goes against press freedom. How would you respond to that uh, briefly? Yeah, very briefly. I would like to make it clear that Nepal is a democratic country and believes in democracy. And in democracy, everything is under constitution, under law, so under separation of power. We have lady president, head of the state, and we have parliament, we have judiciary, we have press, we have people. And people are sovereign. And there is no intention and no action to control or bring under restriction to the phrase. Phrase is completely free in Nepal. And as he said that uh, there is no question of restrictions. But again, I want to say one thing. In the name of freedom, if somebody gives false news and hurts others, and damages others' family life, or life, or prestige, or business, it's not good. I can't say that much. And I want to educate 
my people in this way that we must be responsible because the democracy is the system for all not only for the people who are involved in press but for others also and press is independent and free but must care the lives prestige and loss and benefit of other people also I that's my opinion i'd love to get into a because i could be very happy to proceed for an hour on libel laws and all the rest of it and but i think i'm going to have to move on and I, there was another question i was going to ask and i put it to one side because we're running a bit late so i'm going to ask the audience for questions i'll take 3 at a time we'll see how we do please make it a very short question ideally say who it's addressed to and start off by saying who you are so does anybody i can't see everybody easily yes uh, so perhaps you could stand up say who you are and ask the question um, um anthony hobley um from the uk uh sorry martin i'm going to bring up the b word uh, brexit so the uk parliament's been a model for many parliaments around the world we're having a little bit of a problem at the moment we've had a big exercise in democracy a referendum we've had newspaper headlines calling people the enemy of the country and so forth so many of the problems you describe we're enemy of facing, the people i think enemy of the people sorry and the people's will is being used in many ways to sort of suppress the views of others um i guess my question i mean and it is to the panel whoever wants to take the song and this is probably also something we've seen in the us when there are question, question marks around the legitimacy of an election so interference by a foreign power manipulation through social media breaches of electoral law as we have had on the leave side in the uk how do you deal with that Okay that you don't need to answer yet because I said I will take three questions if there are any further questions anybody else want to ask a question so um well so the question is which is uh I think also very relevant to the US which is um if it is believed widely that an electoral process has been tainted by interference um through social media or some other way um and then that tends to create a very very heated discussion because it relates to the legitimacy of the ruler of the winner the free and fair how you prove free and fair that's a very very big issue and it's clearly a live issue in the US so perhaps i could start with you and then perhaps you um how do we deal with that sort of question i think i'll probably play to the stereotype here you know when you're a hammer everything looks like a nail um uh i i think i think the most important first step is to to dig into the question to report deeply to understand what happened um to bring it to the light um to arm your fellow citizens with uh the clearest possible understanding of of what happened and why um and and that's when the democratic process is supposed to kick in um but that's certainly what what you know what we view as as our ro role and why we've um uh been digging so aggressively into you know a whole host of these questions perhaps I could ask you that from your perspective so i think the question here and i thought a lot about it is you know the basic mantra is democratic elections must be quote unquote free and fair and the obvious question that has been raised in recent years and certainly in the uk and us which are pretty well established democracies is whether a crucial electoral process was free and fair and um so how do you deal with that question in your own country well, how do, I, I, what is the processes through which you can make it credible to the electorate as a whole including particularly obviously the losers that they lost fairly well i i can i can tell you about my story of course because i i must say that i i became president in a democratic process since the very beginning inside my party i i had a you know a great debate with five persons inside my party we 
undertook town halls throughout the whole country. And then, after we had more than 30 debates, we decided to go to a polling system for, for three weeks in a row. So the candidate who, who had the less, uh, the less support was running out, and finally I was elected my, my party's candidate. And then we went for an open election inside a coalition, in an open election. And I got a very important support, more than four million votes. And then I run for a first round for the presidency with other five candidates, and I won with more than seven million votes. And finally, I went to the second round with another candidate, and I won with more than 10 million votes, the, the highest voting uh, record in, in Colombia. So this shows that when there's permanent participation of the people in different stages, democracy is enriched. If you ask me from my experience, why do I see for the future of Colombia? I would love to see all the parties having process less like the one that I faced, because it gave me the opportunity to connect with the people. If you ask me about how candidates from coalition should be chosen, I would love to see more open elections so that people go and vote for ideas and for, and for projects. And I think this enriches democracy. But let me, let me go back to one point that you raised, Martin, on social media. Yeah. I believe social media is a very important tool for democracy because you can connect with, with your message on a daily basis, but it has to be hand in hand with walking the walk, talking the talk in the streets. But social media can also become a very dangerous weapon because sometimes, and it happens, People will try to harm you and they will use fake news and those fake news can, can grow very fast. And I don't see those issues as how do we prohibit that to happen, but how do we have the best reaction networks and tools in order to prevent that from making a damage to democracy? I don't think over-regulation or regulating content is a good solution. I don't believe in that, but I believe that Seeing this, this fake news process happening everywhere, it's also an opportunity for politicians, for institutions, to have a more digital force, a better digital force, to react promptly with the right response and with the truth. I don't think democracy will be enriched by, by limiting those, those, okay. those expressions. I think they have to be promoted and identify the best tools to face it. Prime Minister Pashinyan, uh, so free and fair elections, uh, the process, how do you preserve that? Um, uh, if I may, uh, I would like to say that actually we met our revolution through the social media because uh, we were uh, under media blockade okay. and we, uh, we, can, uh, we were able to um, uh, have a breakthrough uh, uh, with use of social media. But now uh, I'm continuing to uh, to have live broadcast in in my Facebook page, and uh, when uh, I'm trying to uh, to reveal some uh, some uh, um, uh, false content uh, about me about government, I was uh, I'm being criti criticized um, uh, that I'm uh, making pressure on the press. And it is a very interesting and very soft situation, which concerns um, uh, uh, to the relation between media and uh, free and fair elections. You know, I don't think that there is an issue when we have very clear and obvious majority. Uh, I, I think in that cases we, uh, we, we haven't an issue. But when we have very narrow uh, majority and very narrow differences between candidates, it can become a big issue because it should be checked if uh, which, which factors affect it on, on the results of, uh, of such results. And it's very, uh, very possible that one uh, or two fake news um, uh, uh, that uh, have uh, 
uh, issued in the last uh, last uh, uh, last minute news can affect on uh, result of elections and of course it is big issue but what to do with that it is very very big problem because i'm proud to say that now our country was uh, was uh, evaluated that the country with free internet but uh, this freedom uh, bring uh, opportunity for news exchange, of course, for transparency, but of course, it, uh, it opens a huge, huge field for false news, fake news, and it's, uh, of course, effect on the realities in our country and worldwide. But uh, I will be frank, I don't know what to do with this situation. Is if, anyone, uh, is if anyone knows it, it, it is very good news for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have a question? We're coming towards the end. You're all completely happy with the state of the... Oh, yes, please. I have a question. It's one aspect that hasn't come up, and that's basically the economic viability of the press, and it's primarily addressed to Mr. Salzburg. People of my generation bought newspapers when we were younger, and we have no problems paying for electronic access by having a subscription. But I think that's one of the problems why people do no longer read the traditionally, if or the old media, so to say, because they have to pay for it, and they tend towards social media. What is the response, and how could that be improved in order to give more access to younger people to what I would call independent media? Thank you. It's a very good question, which I should have asked. but uh, <laughs> And the reason I didn't ask it <laughs> is that, of course, it's just too painful. Um, so. Um, what is the economic model of the traditional? Um, yeah, if we're coming back to the traditional media, or indeed any, it does not need to be any media that is doing something that's obviously really quite costly. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think actually you 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 just uh, hit on something there at the end. I mean, first I think it's really important not to um, lean too hard on the word media, which has become a catch-all phrase from, you know, everything from, you know three of our reporters spending 18 months to build the most, you know, going through 100,000 pages of documents to build the most comprehensive portrait of the president's wealth um, to date, to three people on a panel on cable news yelling at each other, one of whom's a, you know, a, a right-wing hack, one of whom's a left-wing hack, and, you know, one of whom is ostensibly moderating. That, that, that phrase, media, is, isn't always the most helpful. Um, what I think really matters, and what I suspect you believe matters, is independent reporting and, um, and, and the expertise um, that adds uh, nuance and insight that uh, isn't necessarily already there. That's incredibly expensive work. And um, the business model has uh, eroded so quickly that since the year 2000, more than half of American journalists have lost their jobs in total numbers and in percentage terms. That's, that's, um, that means uh, journalists are losing jobs faster than coal miners. Um, I think we're starting to see some real signs of, um, of uh, optimism here. It's, I, I suspect it'll be a long, hard road, uh, probably um, another decade of really hard work. Um, you know, at the New York Times, um, we have more people paying for subscriptions than we did at any point in our history. Um, and we have more people uh, reading us, 150 million around the world, with subscribers in every country in the world um, than at any point in our history. That's really encouraging. The problem is, um, right now, uh, we haven't seen that model uh, be able to scale. And we should be really clear-eyed about what we're losing um, as, as we wait for, for that model, as we wait for answers. What we're losing is reporters inside communities asking tough questions, um, searching for information, um, uh, and, and sharing it with the public. That, that, you know, that is an accountability layer that really matters. It's also a layer of social cohesion, of social glue. The glue of common understanding, I think, is one of the most important elements of a democracy, being able to agree on a set of facts. Um, and I think one of the things that, that I would call for is for you know, every, every news consumer to make sure that they are making the choices with where they spend their time and their, and their money um, that reward you know, original important work. 
Thank you very, very much. Very important topic. Um, I'm going to have to close it. Um, this is obviously a discussion that has touched on just a few aspects of one of the really great issues of our time. Um, I had wanted, but I never got around to it, um, to have some discussion of the challenge created by the very visible success of an enormous um, non-democracy, namely China, which is obviously very seductive to a lot of people, um, just as in the 50s and 60s the Soviet Union was, in not making other comparisons. So I couldn't go there. But what I take from this is, uh, fortunately, there are, and we've had three represented here, developing countries with which have shown, where, whose peoples have shown a strong and passionate commitment, some of it quite recent, to establishing constitutional democracies. Um, that is part of and a continuation of what I used to think, and in many ways still do, was an incredibly encouraging development of the last 40 years. And it is important to remember that on any criteria, there are far more democracies now and far higher proportion of the world's countries are democratic now, that is to say, have viable electoral processes than they did in the 1970s. And we should never forget that. It's really, really important, and we should never give this up. Second point, unfortunately, um, uh, Western countries and above all the main one, the big one, which really uh, pushed the belief in democracy as a norm and everything that went with it, the rule of law, the free press, all the whole thing has at least under current management seemed lost confidence. That's a nice way of putting it. One might say has not merely lost confidence but is actively promoting the loss of confidence in these norms. And that is making the world uh, much more dangerous for democratic norms. And as um, uh, Daniela Balu Ares pointed out, <coughs> this reflects in part a profound loss of confidence in the peoples of many de democratic Western countries. And it's not just the US, it's all over Europe in the effectiveness, legitimacy, uh, and credibility of the democratic process. And, and there are lots of polls, you mentioned some, and I've read, I'm writing a book on this, um, which underline this, and it's terrifying. And, and it's, along with that lot is a deinstitutionalization of politics, which you mentioned, the collapse of parties, of systems of vote. The third point, and I've only got two others to emphasize, is we had, a, I think, a very useful discussion uh, of, of social media. And I think what came out of this very nicely, and I was very pleased with what you said, is it's sort of double-edged. It has created great opportunities and great challenges. I've sort of thought about it a bit <coughs> like what happened to the, the world when the printing press hit it. We didn't, it took us about 300 years to work out what to do with the printing press. Unfortunately, we compressed all that. Uh, you know, obviously all our political scientific revolutions, everything else were dictated, but it's taken, we're at a very, let's say, we, we got the 2.2 billion people on Facebook, which didn't exist 20 years ago, 15 years ago. What does this mean? We don't know. Can we contain what's put on it? Not obviously. Um, um, uh, the final um, crucial point, which I think I would stress very, very powerfully, because it's something I believe passionately, that it's really impossible to run a democracy without some, and you got it very well, I think, uh, um, some glue of a common understanding of the world. There's a very famous sentence which seems so quaint now uh, from a very great American senator of the 60s, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who said, um, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember, but basically you're entitled to your private opinions, but you're not entitled to your private facts. And if you don't accept that there is a common body of facts, and it's not just whatever you find convenient to believe, and fake news is not what you find inconvenient to believe, but what's untrue. Um, if you don't accept that as the basis, since democracy is ultimately a process of common shared discussion, reaching shared conclusions which are legitimate, if you don't have that at all, um, then I think you are in a really terrible mess. And it does seem to me, at least in some of our countries, that's where we are. So we will probably have to hope that the developing countries will save us from our own follies. Thank you very, very much Thank for you this. So much.